Oh dear, right. Um, hello, I'm Carrie Lewis and it's lovely to be here tonight. I'm going to talk to you about bees. That's what I'm going to do. Drwy gwawn hyda'r gwenyn ac yna si o ganant emyn ar ddifir gerdd fo'r y gwyn mal air is ymhlyr rhosyn. I've been checking the hives this winter again, hefting their weight, tipping them gently to one side to get a sense of how heavy they are, how much honey is left to see them through until spring, trying to gauge how resilient they might be after the long, cold months. And I've been worried. The unpredictability of the last few years have been difficult for them. The long, dry spells and the sudden storms. They seemed depleted. Last autumn, as they began to slow down and fold themselves around the Queen in their winter cluster, you could hear the weariness in the dissonance of their song. And then, a few weeks ago, I watched nervously as a spell of unseasonably warm weather drew them out. One, three, a few dozen, measuring the angle of the sun, trying to locate the first flowers of spring, the primrose, the lungwort, the crocus. And just as their cluster began to loosen a little, just as they ventured tentatively outward once again, came the sharp shock of cold weather. I fed them a little fondant sugar, just enough to keep them going, and placed a pillow in the roof of their hive to try and keep off the worst of the cold. It is well known that bees teach us all sorts of things to respect our environment, the benefits of working in service of others, and the knowledge that attacking others only brings harm to ourselves. Also, that men can be a little lazy. <laughs> they also teach us about the value of democracy. There is a common misconception about the Queen that she's a spoiled dictator, being fed with royal jelly as she languishes on some pillowy cushion, when in fact she is the servant of the hive, dutifully laying up to 2,000 eggs a day. And if her creativity is found lacking, a whisper spreads through the hive and she is replaced. The greatest lesson that I learned, though, was that keeping bees requires that you become part of a greater social circle. It is almost impossible to keep them alone. You will need a spare hive, your queen will get into difficulties, or you will need advice. To this end, I joined Cymdeithas Winanna Ceredigion, the only Welsh language society in existence. After being a member for a little while, it became evidently clear that the halcyon days of beekeeping were well over. The times when queens lived for three years or more and the seasons were stable. The world has changed. Everything seems to have changed. So what's to be done? This is the question that is discussed at our monthly meetings and all suggestions seem to lead back to one thing. Coming together to nurture, to strengthen, to support the planting of flowers to extend the pollen season, the shielding from the cold, the supplementary feeding until things stabilize. But there's something else too. I will never forget the first time I opened a hive. It was spring and they'd finished their win overwintering. Will Griffiths from the Beekeeping Society taught me how. At 85, he's kept bees for 50 years, so there's not a lot he doesn't know. I had read the books, of course, and studied the theory, but being there in front of the hive was a completely different experience. He taught me basic manners, how to approach a hive, to knock and announce my arrival rather than barge into their home, how to stand to the side so as not to disturb their flight paths, how to crack open the hive gently so as not to break the wax seal laid down by the bees over winter to keep the out drafts and other insects. But what he did next wasn't in the books. I watched as he placed a palm on the crown board after taking off the roof. He lay it there a while, a slow smile spreading. He doesn't wear gloves, of course, and he encouraged me to take off mine. He wanted me to learn to gauge the mood of the hive. A hive, after all, is a living thing, a collective mind, an organism of many. You can't expect it to be the same every time. You have to take its cultural and societal temperature before proceeding. 
He asked me to listen to the sound first. He is a devout chapel man and learned the sol fa for sight singing and started to hum the same note as the bees. And then he took away his hand and asked me to put mine down. I did so tentatively, trying to ignore the stray bees landing on the back of my hand. But as my fingers made contact with the crown board, the square board covering the frames, I was astonished to feel the hive reverberating with life. My fingers came alive. The hive was bursting with energy, vibrating with a low frequency that made my skin prickle. It was the closest I have come to feeling the force of life, the force that through the green fields drives the flower, the innate drive of living things. It was like touching hope itself. Will smiled at me and confided that he didn't even like honey. <laughs> hope, it seems, is within us, but is it also outside of us? And that is a great comfort. It is both an inextricable part of us and something bigger than us. It is tenuous, imperceptible, but also vast. When it is difficult to feel, we need to nurture it with kindness in others and in ourselves. We need to quieten down long enough so we can listen for it. The milder weather is back in West Wales. The fields are covered in daisies and the willow catkins will tie the bees over until the dandelions flower and the proper nectar flow begins. Before coming to London a few days ago, I checked on the hive again, took away the pillow and listened as Will had taught me. My heart sunk. It was quiet, silent even. But then I placed down the palm of my hand in a quiet communion. And although it was faint, it was there, quivering the pulse of nature, the relentlessness of living things, the belief in summer and of better things to come. <laughs>